This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on April 5th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, we are recording in Albany, New York, about two hours north of New York City. And I am at the University at Albany, which is part of the SUNY system, State University of New York. And uh, I have a couple of local guests. We're going to talk about the virology that goes on here upstate. And uh, on my left, from the University of Albany, returning for her second time on TWIV, Cara Pogger. Welcome back. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Pogger like lager. Exactly. Do you, do you like lager? I'm not a beer fan. Oh. I like cider. It's the best thing about moving to <laughs> upstate New York. Cool. And also next to Kara, Rachel Netzband. Welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. You are a student in Kara Like Lager's lab, yes. right? Yes, I am. I'm a fifth year PhD student. <laughs> okay. Welcome. And we'll talk with, with you as well, of course. And from the New York State Department of Health at the Wadsworth Center, Alex Siona. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for visiting us up north. Pleasure. Yeah, I've been here before, actually. Um, a couple of times. First time, I have to tell you, the first time was shortly after I went to Columbia in the early 80s. Somebody invited me here, and I don't remember who or where, but his lab was in a Quonset hut. Oh, you know, wow. one of those round metal yeah. structures. I don't know what he was associated. He was an interesting fellow. Here at Albany? Yeah, it was here. Wow. And then I came back years later, and I think I gave a seminar at the Wadsworth. Larry... Sturman? St yeah, he invited me. Yep. Was he at the Wadsworth? He was. He yeah. retired, right? Yeah. Okay. And now, so I think this is my third uh, official visit, although I passed through many times on the way to Montreal. So, um, Ciota, is that Ciota good? is correct, yes. It's Italian origin, right? It is. How yep. far back can you trace your... Uh, my great-grandfather came from uh, Sicily. Okay. Yep. Sicily. I have yep. to watch out for you, right? Uh, I get, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Okay. So, Kara, you were last on TWIV 194. Yep. That was in August 2012. It we was. recorded it at ASV, which was in Madison, remember? I do remember that. Okay, good. Five postdocs in North America. Mm -hmm. And it was you along with Matt Dougherty, John David DeJong, and Helen Lazier, and Stephen Oliver. That's right. Now... That episode came about because I had previously done a, a TWIV in Glasgow with uh, five postdocs, and their stories were so depressing. They oh, had no. no future. They were doing multiple postdocs. They had no chance of getting jobs. So I said, I have to do the one in North America to, to tell people <laughs> that it's different. So we did that. And actually, on TWIV, I said, hey, I'm going to ASV to do this. Who wants to be on it? And all of you responded. Yeah. So you are by no means a proper survey. You were self-selected. We were. And you're the people who volunteer for things. Not everybody does that, as you know, right? And I, I said at the time, let's come back in five years and see where you all are. And it's more than five it years is. now. But Helen Lazier has been on TWIV. She has. She was at the beginning of the Zika, Zika. virus outbreak. That's right. That's right. And in fact, we had her on. I said, now for her first time on TWIV, Helen Lazier, she said, actually, I've been because <laughs> I had forgotten. <laughs> So she's at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I know Matt Dougherty is at San Diego, UCSD, I believe. That's right. Correct. And you are here at the University at Albany. I don't know about John David DeJong and Stephen Oliver. Do you have any idea? I think Stephen is still at Stanford. Uh -huh. um, but I'm not certain. Okay. I occasionally see him at ASV. Maybe at some point we can have one with all of us again. We should. How take, about it this ASV? Take 10 years if they come, right? If Are you going to be at ASV? Of course. Okay, very good. Never miss it. So uh, at least three of the five have done really well. So that's, um, that's exciting. 
Now, Kara, when, when we talked to you in August 2012, you were still in your postdoc, right? I was. I was actually just getting ready to start here at Albany in September. Okay. Ah, so you already had the job and lined up and I you were did. definitely coming. I did, yeah. I think you probably said that I did. in the episode. But it was a long time ago. Six it, years, I seven know. years. It's, it's going to be seven years in the fall. Mm -hmm. Wow. So in that time, you, you came here and started your lab? I did. I started my lab um, carrying on what I was doing as a postdoc. And um, so we were studying hepatitis C and looking at RNA granules. And we were specifically focusing on one particular protein, DDX6, which is an RNA helicase. Um, and I had submitted some grants and I'd gotten good feedback, but again, people were like, well, we have drugs, so why do we care? <laughs> uh, and so, but you know, in, in fairness, that got me thinking. And so I was like, well, maybe I need to try and diversify myself. And so we started to do a little bit of dengue virus work. And then, every, and then of course, the Zika virus outbreak came out. Mm. And I was like, this is a great opportunity. Um, we don't know yeah. very much about the virus. It's a super cool virus. And so we actually landed up switching over, um, still keeping the same theme mm -hmm. of looking at RNA metabolism. But um, now we've diversified. One of my students is still looking at RNA granules. Um, but Rachel here has been doing the work on um, RNA modifications. Mm -hmm. And then one of my students is also looking at RNA structure. So we've really sort of diversified from what I did as a postdoc. Now, when you, when you came, how soon after that did you have people in your lab? Well, I got rotation students the first, I didn't take students the first semester, um, but I did take them the second semester while I was setting okay. up. Um, and I had rotation students, um, I had undergrads in the lab. And so, yeah. And do, did you have to teach right away? I did not. The university's actually been really good about increasing the load. Um, so the first year we have off, we don't teach. Mm -hmm. And then the second year I taught my first course, which was cell biology to undergraduates. Um, my chair at the time was very kind because he only gave me a class of 70. It has since ramped up to 200. <laughs> <laughs> and then my third year I started team, team teaching virology with my colleague in Nangwang. Okay. And so um, we're going to talk about your science, but let me talk to uh, Rachel and Alex a little bit about their background. So Rachel, you're a fifth year student with CARA. Yes, I am. <laughs> so that means 2014 you joined her lab. Yes. So it was already established and running. Uh, yeah, for the most part. Um, the one thing I do remember is that <laughs> the very day that I started, Kara was having her baby. So I didn't <laughs> actually get a chance to meet Kara <laughs> until a couple weeks later. Um, so that was July. That was 4th. July 2014. Yeah. Yep. So the baby was born Ju on July 4th? No, July 17, 17. 2014. That was the day that I started in the lab. <laughs> I was like, okay, time. yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, where are you from originally? Rachel? I'm from Syracuse area, um, and I went to undergrad at SUNY Oswego. And actually, I think, well, to me, it's a fairly interesting story of how I got interested in viruses and how I ended up in Albany. So... Um, I've always been very interested in reptiles and amphibians, and I used to go, you know, catch salamanders and frogs and everything. Um, and when I went to undergrad, I had these two professors, one a paleontologist, Dr. Jen O'Lory, and one a uh, mycologist studying fungi, uh, Dr. Sophia Winstam at Oswego. And they wanted to start an amphibian monitoring project to look for um, Betrachochytrium dendrobotitis, the chytrid fungus, to mm -hmm. see if it was in our local populations. Um, but they also had this other idea to start looking at ronavirus, a viral infection that affects frogs, a double-stranded DNA virus. Um, and so they wanted to have somebody basically take on that project and get that going. So I was the one who volunteered. I was like, I'm interested in frogs. Why don't I go out, you know, trudge in the wetlands, go catch frogs and uh, take samples to try and test for this virus? Well, it turned out as we kept doing this and as I was, you know, the only person doing all of the PCR and all of the research on uh, this frog virus, I realized that I was really more interested in the virus than the frogs. <laughs> so my passion throughout life of these amphibians and reptiles got me into viruses, and I realized that the viruses themselves are super cool. So that's how I decided I wanted to go into a graduate program that looked at virology. And so that's how I ended up in Kara's lab, because she was working on viruses. She was not too far away. I'm a bit of a homebody. I want to be near my family. So I came to Albany area and started work in Cara's lab, working truly as a virologist instead of as a herpetologist. Cool. Great so. story. 
All right, Alex, where are you from originally? Uh, Syracuse, New York. Wow. Right down the road. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, also a, a local local product. Um, yeah, so I moved back to this area 16 years ago. I actually live in Saratoga Springs, up north. So, um, Very nice town. Beautiful town. So the, the commute's not so nice, but... Um, down here every day, but it is. Uh, How many hour drive is it? It's it's about an hour usually. Which the traffic can be pretty bad, mm. so um, winters is a little rough for that. But, Especially um, for snowstorms. Yeah, so I've learned to kind of find my my zen state in the car <laughs> um, on my good days, and uh, yeah. So I I've been actually in the arbovirus lab for fifteen years. Um, I've, I, my, I guess career path is kind of um, circuitous because I was prior, I was living in Boston prior to moving back this way and um, teaching high school biology. Mm-hmm. So I, when I, right out of undergrad, I, I... Where'd you go to college? Um, see, these are, th- these are harder questions <laughs> than you would think because I, I've always been a bit of a confused um, child and adult, so, we all? so <laughs> I changed my my uh, career path quite a few times. But um, I graduated from SUNY Cortland. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that was my last last two years with a degree in biology and secondary education, and um, but then moved to Boston and took a job in a uh, immunogenetics lab with a, looking at um, allergic inflammation in a mouse model. So I was doing research um, that was. Um, at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and um, then I went to grad school for the first time um, at Tufts, got my master's there. I was in a PhD program there, but couldn't really find anything I was passionate about, left with my master's. And um, Was that the Tufts downtown in Boston? Medford. Med- yeah. Medford, okay, yeah. outside. Yeah, and I was doing, I did some, some um, neurobio research, some endocrinology, stress response research all, all over the map. Um, and then took a job teaching high school biology in Newton, Massachusetts for a year and a half. Um, Taught the kids of Harvard professors, right? (laughs) That's right, exactly. (laughs) And they reminded me of that often. (laughs) Um, And that was a great job, but I missed using my brain in other ways. So when I moved back here, I, I did teach for a bit while I was looking for a job back in research, but uh, then ultimately landed in the arbovirus lab and was fortunate enough to be able to finish my PhD while staying in that lab um, under Laura Kramer and um, never left. So 15 years. So you didn't really do a postdoc. You just stayed on and worked. I did. Right? Yeah, I did an extended pre-doc. Yeah, Because yeah, okay. <laughs> I didn't go back until uh, my early 30s. So... I finished in 2012 here, SUNY, SUNY Albany, um, in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department, um, but did that research within the arbovirus lab and um, then got my appointment um, because I was always on grant money prior to that and then got the state appointment in um, 2012. And um, now I'm the deputy director of that lab. Laura Kramer is still there and she's a director and still my boss and mentor. and. Um, we have a lot of fun with a lot of different mosquito-borne, tick-borne viruses. So what is the Wadsworth Center? It's a, it's a state laboratory, essentially? It is, yep. It's part of the New York State Department of Health. It's um, a, one of the biggest um, state laboratories. That, um, there's um, huge amounts of research, in, as well as um, clinical testing and surveillance mm-hmm. labs. So it's a combination of... Um, you know, direct clinical public health testing laboratories and then large research labs. So how many people work there roughly? Oh, um, it's in the thousands now. It's a little wow. smaller than, I mean, if you count everybody. I, mm-hmm. I don't know PIs right now. Um, we did downsize quite a bit, but then the last, um, last few years, um, things have come back a bit. And we've been doing some more hiring probably over the last five years. And, um, and it's, a great, it's a great place to work because it's really unique in that you know, you're kind of on the front lines of public health um, and integrating that with research questions. I mean, we do all the mosquito surveillance for New York State outside of 
um, New York City for the counties that participate, and we also do confirmatory clinical testing. So, you know, we have those those duties and, and, and to kind of have the research program and also have access to surveillance samples and be part of the, you know, direct uh, applied public health community is kind of a nice yeah. partnership. And you have a joint appointment here at this unit? I'm an adjunct here. I have an appointment that's so... SUNY Albany bio department is different from, it took me like 15 years to learn this, so um, is different from the, the SUNY Albany School of Public Health. And my department is the Department of Biomedical Sciences that is part of the School of Public Health. That's a um, graduate only program. And um, that's where my primary appointment is. And then I have an adjunct in, in this department also. So you're, he you're here today to record this, but do you come here other times at all? <laughs> I, I do. I'm on Rachel's committee. Yep, for my committee. Okay. Um, yep, and, and Carr and I have um, met frequently and, and are trying to collaborate on a bunch of things. And I've done collaborations with Ng Nang Wang also. And um, um, yeah, we try to we try to integrate as much as we can. Not enough, um, but we're getting better we're at getting it. We're getting there. Okay, I'm going to come back to you. We'll talk about mosquitoes and viruses and ticks. Sounds good. But, uh, Cara, let's talk a little bit about your work. Now, you just published a paper in Journal of Virology, which was also on BioArchive for a while. It was, yeah. That's cool. I'm glad to see more and more scientists doing the BioArchive thing. Zika virus subverts stress granules to promote and restrict viral gene expression. So let's talk about that. Let's first tell everyone what is a stress granule. Do we all have stress granules? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I've got loads of them. You've got loads of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so stress granules are, um, these are RNA protein complexes that form in the cell in response to stress. So this can be if you are hungry or your cell is hungry, um, if there is some sort of um, viral infection, your cells get stressed and what they do is that they try and protect their RNA. Um, and in particular, they try and sort of slow down translation so that they can sort out the stress and then um, return to homeostasis. These are cytosolic, right? These are cytosolic and they are non-membrane bound. Um, mm. So what happens is that you get the activation of um, one of four um, protein kinases that lands up phosphorylating EIF2 alpha to stall translation. And then you get the aggregation of stall translation initiation complexes with the mRNA, with RNA binding proteins in the cytoplasm. Um, these are dynamic in that if you remove the stress, then they will dissipate and the mRNA will be returned to, um, to continue to be translated. And so, we became really interested in this because if you think about um, a viral infection, well, the virus, particularly single-stranded mRNAs, when they get into the cell, the first thing that they have to do is translate their genomes. And so I've really been curious as to how do these viruses land up competing for cellular factors such as the ribosomes. And so if these stress granules are forming, well, that would be inhibitory to these viruses. And with hepatitis C, it has an iris, so it doesn't need a lot of the translation initiation factors, but with viruses such as dengue and Zika that have a cap, this would be um, a, a problem for them. Um, and so that's sort of the question that we went into to say, well, during Zika virus infection, are these stress granules forming? Um, and if they're not, why not? Um, and so that's how we started with the project. So the, you, you mentioned that when translation is stalled, and you mentioned EIF2 phosphorylation, but mm -hmm. other ways that translation is inhibited would also lead to, to these granules forming, or is it specifically EIF2 alpha phosphorylation? So there are EIF2 alpha independent mechanisms as well. But the way that we typically characterize it is that yeah. if you look for EIF2 alpha phosphorylation, um, so, uh, what is the, and these stress granules have proteins that make them up, right? They, they do. They've got more than 200 of them. 200? It's amazing. What do you mix. need so many proteins to make a stress <laughs> granule? Oh my gosh. And, but, Everybody wants part of the action. Yeah, and well, that's good for us because we can divide it all up, right? <laughs> so, but what is the actual trigger? I mean, you have EIF2 alpha phosphorylated. What, 
what's between that and a stress granule forming? Do we know? I don't think that we know. Um, I mean, you have the dissociation of, you have the stalling of translation, and does that then cause, you know, the free RNA is now available for RNA binding proteins to associate with it. Um, that's a possibility. Um, yeah. So if I if I treat cells with pyromycin, which is a mm. protein synthesis inhibitor, will they make? Um, yes, they will. Stress granules. They will. Okay. Yeah. And does every cell in our body make stress granules? Does do neurons make stress? They granules? do. Neurons do make stress granules. In fact, mm. neurons have got they also their own type of granule, if you want. They're known as neuronal granules. And these are really catchy title. Yeah, very, very <laughs> catchy, original as well. Um, but these are a little bit different in that they also contain stalled RNA um, complexes, but they aren't induced in response to stress. But rather, if you think about it, you've got your axon, so you've got the cell body, mm -hmm. and then you need to have translation occurring right out at the synapses. And so you have these translationally repressed granules that land up being transported along um, the full length of the cell down to the synapses. Um, and so they actually have many of the same proteins that you do find in stress granules as well. So if I feel foggy, does that mean I have stress granules forming? Maybe? Maybe. Maybe okay. you just need to like boost your translation a do little bit. Do mosquitoes make stress granules too? I don't know. It's a good question, right? I, I bet mean, they do. Yeah, I would sure. assume. Yeah. It's, yeah. How, so how far back on the phylogenetic tree have people looked for these? Is it just in mammals or? Elsewhere, nobody's looked. I actually don't know. It could be a good collaboration. Yeah. All right. I think you have a lot of mosquitoes, right? We do. No shortage <laughs> I just of heard you, I heard you talk about pulling legs off before. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's something we, you know, a unique thing that we do in my lab every day. <laughs> Delegging. Something for fun. <laughs> Collecting <laughs> mosquito spit mosquitoes and pulling legs. I say, on Twiv, I say poor mosquitoes, and Alan Dove says, what? <laughs> they bite me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I don't have any guilt associated with that <laughs> procedure. <laughs> um, all right. So you look to see in cells infected with Zika virus whether these form. So do they? First of all, how do you look to see if stress granules form? Um, so we do a visual inspection. We use a visual inspection. My visual car. Inspection. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't get a certification at the end to say that you have stress granules or not. <laughs> Um, we use confocal microscopy, mm -hmm. um, so we fix the cells and then stain for particular stress granule markers. Using antibodies? Right? Using antibodies. Okay. Um, and they're actually really cool in that you can see, if you look at particular stress granules um, markers, so some of them are in, so we look at proteins like, um, you can use the translation initiation factor, EIF3B, um, you can use the um, sort of sort of canonical stress granule proteins such as G3BP, which is an RNA binding protein. It's also known to be an aggregator of stress granules as well. That's cytoplasmic. There's also um, a tier one and tier R, which are nuclear. And what you do is that you compare them against uninfected cells. Um, mm -hmm. So an uninfected cell will have very few? You can, very few. Generally, you won't see them, but you do see them in uninfected in, cells. When yeah. you put cells on plates, that's probably yeah. stress. Yeah. <laughs> just, just by that. Um, <laughs> and um, we then fix the cells, use antibodies to see them. And okay. you can see in uninfected cells, you see very few, whereas in infected cells, you see these nice big blobs. Mm -hmm. um, and those are indicative of stress granules. So when you infect with Zika virus, do you see lots of stress granules? We actually don't. Um, they very few cells. It depends on the level of infection. In early infection, if you see just a very small amount of infection, you can see stress granules. Mm -hmm. um, but most part, no, Zika gets rid of them, which is really interesting. Because that's part of your title. It that subverts is, yeah, them. It subverts them, yes. So it, initially you see a few and then they go away. Same thing with polio, by the way, right? I know. They the first go on and then polio, in fact, cleaves so as a protease that cleaves one of the components, yeah, right? G3BP1. Right. And so we actually looked, that was one of the first experiments that we did, was to look to see if the virus is stopping the formation of these stress granules, is it because it's cleaving mm -hmm. a protein like G3BP? And it doesn't. Um, we do see a very small amount reduction of G3BP, but it's certainly not as dramatic as polio. Um, and so we went on and we looked to see, was it because it was changing the abundance or the integrity of these proteins, and it doesn't. Um, Did you look at all 200? No, we didn't. We didn't. <laughs> um, I, I think I think Gaston, my 
graduate student would have shot me if that was the case. <laughs> I suppose I shouldn't joke about that, but um, yeah. It, he's he's um, very um, meticulous, but I think if I'd asked him to screen all 200. We could do it by mass spec, right? We could, and you can actually isolate the stress granules. Roy Parker right. um, came mm -hmm. up with a very nice method to isolate stress granules. So um, that would have been really cool if we could isolate the stress granules from infected cells to see which proteins are there, but they don't form, so mm -hmm. that's a no-go. So what is, in the end, what is blocking their formation or subverting them, as you say? Um, well, so there have been a couple of other papers out there to suggest that um, so there was one paper out there to say that it's, the virus actually promotes rapid dephosphorylation of EIF2-alpha. Mm -hmm. So if you no longer have, if EIF2-alpha is no longer phosphorylated, the mRNAs can be returned to translation and you get the dissipation of stress granules. What we found was that the proteins, um, the virus actually recruits some of the proteins to um, replication complexes, and in particular G3BP1, which is one of the nucleators of stress granules. Um, and then we also found that it also recruits a protein, another RNA binding protein, HUR, as well. Um, but what was really cool about that was that HUR actually seems to be inhibitory. So if we remove HUR from the cell by using siRNAs to deplete it, um, we get an increase in virus protein and RNA and viral titers, mm -hmm. uh, which was really unexpected um, because for alpha viruses, they've actually shown that HUR stabilizes the viral RNA. And this so is a component of stress granules. This is a component okay. of stress granules. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really unexpected. So you take that away and Viral replication increases. Viral replication increases, correct. Mm. Now, and then, in the course of an infection, what's the, the level of that protein? Does it go down or up? It doesn't. It remains constant. Same. But what we see is, though, that you do get, you do get a relocalization into the cytoplasm, um, mm. significant. So that's probably part of what, what is helping. Mm -hmm. So the, the bottom line is that the virus is, is reversing the formation of stress granules. Uh, exactly how you're not sure. I'm sure you want to continue to do right, that. Right, um, right. We're also really interested in these proteins as to what exactly they're doing. Yeah. Um, so what, what kinds of experiments do you have to do to answer that? Well, at the moment, um, my we would like to see what if HUR is actually binding the RNA, um, and if so, where it's binding, because that would also be important. The fact, mm -hmm. if it is binding, and that would suggest that it's destabilizing the RNA, um, which would be really interesting in of itself, because this protein mostly is known to stabilize RNA, so it would be a reverse mechanism. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about this protein is that it's also associated with RNA splicing and alternative polyadenylation. So by relocalizing it as well, mm -hmm. you might end up changing other cellular metabolism pathways as well. And that's something that my student Gaston is now looking mm -hmm. into. So is the relo So this is a nuclear protein that comes out during infection? Correct. Do you know how it comes out? Is it something done to the NUP, the nuclear? Mm, no, that's a really interesting question. Proteins, right? Because for polio, right. it trashes yeah. the NUPs, exactly, as yeah. Peter Sarno yeah. worked on, right? Yeah. And all these nuclear proteins come out, and some of them participate in... Right. Virus reproduction. No, that's already that's already Could cool be interesting idea. to know, yeah, right? Absolutely. Because something is happening to let these proteins come out. They don't mm -hmm. just come out on their own. Now, in your paper, you talk about looking in the in uh, in neurons to see if similar things are happening. Is that in the books? That is in the books. Um, and actually, what's interesting is that HUR is a ubiquitous protein, so it's found everywhere, sort of in every cell that you look mm -hmm. at. It is a it's localized in the nucleus. But there are other proteins that are in the same families, um, and these are H, U, B, C, and D. And those are neuron-specific, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. Um, and so we have this idea is that maybe those proteins are having a similar role um, during Zika virus infection in neurons. And that's something else that Gaston is looking at at the moment, to see what whether they function in the same way. Right. So uh, you probably know you can make lovely neurons from uh, induced pluripotent stem cells yes, now. Yes, yes. Which I could never do when I was starting. I always wanted to infect neurons with polio virus, and you couldn't get neurons, but now you can get and, them. Yeah. 
And uh, it, I'm sure you're going to look at that. That would be very interesting. <clears throat> we also make brain slices from mice. Right. And it would be interesting to look in those to see this process. Because the closer you can get to an animal, of course, Absolutely. would be better. Absolutely. Or, or informative, I would say, right? Yeah. Um, so this is a new field since you left Peter for you, right? This idea of stress granules and virus right. infection. And when in Peter's lab, you were uh, working on... DDX6, is that right? That's correct. So I, I have to ask you this, and then we're going to... I have a feeling, Rachel, you're working on this this epitranscriptome from what I heard in the car this morning. Yes, so absolutely. So I, I can talk to her about that, right? Absolutely. But first, you have this paper, this DDX6 modulates the interaction of MIR-122 with the hep C RNA. So I think this is such a cool story that this microRNA of a cell is needed for the virus to replicate. It is very cool. So, but DDX6 is a helicase, right? It is. So what is, what is, tell us what's happening there. Oh, um, well, so with hepatitis C, it requires, like you said, this liver-specific microRNA-122, and um, this microRNA-122 has to bind to two specific sites in the five prime end of the mm -hmm. virus, so right at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really, we know that both sites have to be occupied, so it can't just bind one versus the other. And um, what they found is that there are some particular proteins that the site one seems to be important. And there are some particular proteins that will end up binding this, um, obscuring the binding site. And um, it has to be displaced and then microRNA-122 can bind. And the microRNA is there to stabilize the viral RNA. And then Stan Lemon had a really nice paper showing that it might also help with the transition between translation and replication. Mm -hmm. um, but what we actually found was that DDX6 seems to be affecting the binding of the microRNA to the second site. Mm -hmm. And so we have this idea that right sort of immediately downstream of that second site, in fact, the second site goes right up against the second stem loop. And so one of the things we had, the idea was that maybe this DDX6 is changing the structure of um, that second binding site or the stem loop to allow mm -hmm. the risk complex to come and bind. So that would involve its its activity as a helicase, Correct. which unwinds duplexes, Correct. right? Correct, yeah. Okay. And so that is somehow unwinding to allow the second microRNA to bind. Right. And you can show that by depleting DDX6? Yep. So when you do that, the second microRNA doesn't bind? We haven't done those experiments. We haven't looked to see whether it, it binds or not. So the problem with depleting DDX6 is that you do that and you deplete the virus. Um, completely. And so it's a little bit difficult. You know, do you have enough it's RNA? it's degraded then? It's degraded. Right. So these microRNAs protect the RNA from degradation, right? Correct. XRN1? XRN1, the one, nuclease? yeah. Okay. I'm making sure I teach yeah. the right things to my no, students. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stan Lemon had the really beautiful paper showing that XRN1 does that. Right. Um, now, normally in the cell, uh, DDX6, what does it do? Like, where is its helicase activities needed? Um, so it's... Um, it's it does two things. So one is that it's actually involved in decapping RNA, um, mm -hmm. so that the RNA can, so normal cellular mRNAs can be degraded. So your cap on the five prime end normally protects the cells right. from degradation, but then you have your decapping complex that comes along, removes the cap, and then the XRN one can choose. Um, choose it up. But so DDX six helps with remodeling the five prime end so okay. that the RNA can be degraded. But it's also been shown to be part of the microRNA complex as well. And so it, it, with the microRNA complex, it's there to help regulate or um, promote microRNA regulation, which is why we think that it's actually involved with hepatitis C, because it's not necessarily the RNA degradation function, but rather that it's associated with the microRNA complex. So it's involved in normal RNA turnover in the cell. Correct. And Correct. Of course, as viruses do, they have evolved to utilize yep. that to help protect the genome f uh, by putting on this second. It's interesting that the two are, and the, the DDX6 doesn't participate in the in the first microRNA no, binding. No, I, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'm sure that it's important for protein protein complexes, 
you know, just to keep everything functioning properly. But it's really mm -hmm. is, it's a second binding site that it's acting at. So if you deplete uh, DDX6 and then you infect with hep C, you don't get rep replication. We don't get replication. But the first micro will, you can show that the first micro RNA is bound to any RNA that's present or? We can. So yeah. we've done sort of genetic complementation studies to show that it's bound. Neat. Are you still working on this? Or has um, the Zika seduced you? Z Zika has seduced <laughs> us, but it, it, hepatitis C is still close to the heart. <laughs> we're still yeah. doing work with it, but um, we've moved on from DDXX. You know, the, you were talking before we started about how, uh, you know, when you submit a hep C grant, they, the reviewers say, well, hep C can be cured. There's no point in working. But that's such a unfortunate attitude because you can learn fundamental things. Right. Right. For, right. And polio, we've been studying for exactly, years since yeah. we had a vaccine. We still learn things. Right. And so we actually recently got a grant, and the grant is using hepatitis C as a model system. Great. Um, because there's so many reagents available for it, um, and it's a really powerful system. Yeah, I, I think like you polio. have to. Well, polio, we still work on, um, and we learn new things. For example, we recently found that the virus replicates in astrocytes. Yeah. And everyone always thought it was a neuron-specific virus. And I'm having a lot of trouble getting that funded. Huh because it's polio. <laughs> Why should we work on polio? But I think, you know, astrocytes are looming to be more important in uh, neurotropic virus infections. We thought viruses just infect neurons. I think even West Nile goes into astrocytes as well as neurons. Astrocytes can secrete neurotoxic substances, so it's cool. Yeah. Anyway, so there's another paper uh, that you've published, and I think this is where Rachel can tell us about it. It's called Positive Sense RNA Viruses Reveal the Complexity and Dynamics of the cellular and viral epitranscriptomes during infection. You work on that, right? Yes. So what is an epitranscriptome? So in the central dogma of biology, we're going from DNA to RNA to proteins. And so epigenomics is when you have chemical marks added to the DNA and the genome. So epitranscriptomics is when we're looking at uh, these chemical marks that are placed on the RNA. So there can be these um, chemical modifications on uh, viral RNAs, cellular RNAs. They're part of uh, normal homeostatic processes. And so they're, they're fairly common in the cells. And it's kind of become a big booming area of research lately. And it's become kind of trendy to work on. <laughs> so this um, is like M N6 -A, M6A, M6A modification. Yes, N6 we, methyladenosine. Yes, is we very, had Stacy Horner on TWIV last yes. summer to talk mm -hmm. about that, right? And that's just one of what 140 different modifications. Over 140 that are known, exactly. So this is specifically what's happening on the nucleic acid, as opposed to histones for DNA, right? Exactly. That's epigenetic silencing, right? So what are some of the other modifications? That, oh, they're methylation. Oh, yes. There's methylations, acetylations, um, all sorts of changes. There's RNA editing where things are modified from adenosine to inosine, um, which is a powerful antiviral mechanism in the cells. Um, is there any phosphorylation? <sighs> no. 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 But I know histones yeah. can be. Yeah. There's a lysine group that's put onto them. Um, there's a geranyl group that's mm -hmm. placed onto nucle uh, the nucleotide. And some of them are very, very sizable, very large. So you can imagine how they might inhibit translation or um, any of these cellular processes strictly yeah. by um, hindrance. So a lot of functions for these are still being understood. Uh, the modification that we're most interested in is dimethylcytosine. So two methyl groups added to a cytosine nucleotide. Um, so that's primarily one of the big things that came out of that paper was that we see this modification that comes up only in viral infection and in multiple cell lines that we tested, multiple different kinds of viruses always was there. How do you detect these modifications? So what we do is we isolate RNA from our cells, whatever condition they are, infected, uninfected, stressed out, treated with different things, exactly. Um, and we digest the RNA into mononucleotides. So everybody freaks out with RNA. You don't want it to degrade. You don't want it to degrade. So it yeah, to. <laughs> we want it to degrade. <laughs> we want it to be at the mononucleotide level. And then we spray it on our uh, mass spectrometer and can basically see the levels of each of the modifications and each of the canonical bases as well. 
So it's a good confirmatory test if we know approximately how many A's versus G's there are in a cell. We can see that directly. Um, so, but you don't know where in the in the sequence. That's you just the caveat. Know what base it's on, right? Exactly. So there's two different ways to approach the modification question. One is to do a sequencing method. Um, where you can pull down and look for a specific modification. But in that case, you're only looking at one modification. You know the location, but you don't know um, what's going on with all the other ones. We do the opposite approach where we um, basically look at, or we catalog all of the modifications that are there and what their levels are doing. But yes, we don't know exactly where they are. Mm, okay. So this modification you mentioned, the mm -hmm. di... Dimethylcytosine, yes. You found this by chopping up Mm -hmm. to mononucleotides, and you saw exactly. this unusual group. Yeah, we were looking for overall trends that were interesting to us, and just, again, this point that it just showed up always in our infected samples, never in our uninfected samples, at least not at detectable levels, um, meeting our threshold. So it stood out to us for sure. So in this paper, you looked at Zika virus, dengue, hepatitis C, polio, and HIV. Yes. I think you should do all the viruses, don't you? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, how many more can there be? Um, and you say they're all different, right? The profiles that they give are different. There's some things in common, I presume, right? Right. And some, so you do this by mass spec. You just digest the RNA. It's, it's total RNA or is it polyadenylated? Um, so we can do some interesting things for isolating specific RNAs. So yes, we can do total. That's how the paper started. And that's where we found this dimethylcytosine. But then we wanted to locate... Uh, where this dimethylcytosine was occurring. Uh, for example, if it was occurring on a viral RNA, that might be a different um, type of pathway or a different reasoning than if it was occurring just on cellular mRNAs. Um, so what we've done in that paper is we uh, used a pull-down technique to isolate viral genomes and look to see what modifications are specifically on our enriched viral genome. Mm. So how do you get viral genomes only? Well, we did an oligostreptavidin bead um, pull down, basically. Um, so we designed oligos that were targeting three different regions of the viruses. Yep. They and hybridized. So, we did. so they hybridized specifically. You got it. Exactly. You could also do things like um, polysomal RNA. Mm -hmm. It might be interesting to see what's being translated. Yep. And another right. way that we did to um, isolate viruses was to look at what's going on in the cell culture media, so isolating the virions in theory. Um, and then we did pull downs from that just to be sure that we were. So virion RNA also mm -hmm. is modified. Exactly. In many ways too? Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, generally in our samples we found um, on total RNA we could find and detect like 30 or 40 different kinds of modifications. Right. Um, so we saw an overwhelming variety. And so it's, it's really a puzzle to look at these data and try and figure out what the trends are because there's just so much information. It's you know sure. similar to a microarray trying to it's see. The curse, curse of modern science. Right. It's too much data. Too much data. That's right. So these are all these modifications all happen in the cytosol, or do some happen in the nucleus? Do we know? Some happen in the nucleus. Um, so for example, there are modifications, for example, on the ribosome that occur in the nucleus when the ribosomes are being formed and uh, going through processing. Some enzymes are known to. Uh, modify them before they go into the cytosol. Um, but a lot of the enzymes that we've been looking at are cytosolic. So there, there are, I know for the N6, M6 M6A, M6A yep. <laughs> there are interesting metal enzymes, right, and yes. that put on and take off. And then there are readers who see and yep. do something. So there must be a lot of enzymes involved in all these 140. Oh, yeah. because So all there's need... no way you can knock them all out and see the effect, right? <laughs> well, so the caveat is, if in order to do that, you need to know what the enzymes are. So that's yeah, the yeah. problem that we're running into now is that, you know, we have this modification that we're interested, dimethylcytosine, but the enzymes are not known in mammalian cells. Mm. Um, yeah. So we're, the, we're working on... The adenosine on... modification, they know, and so they, that's exactly. what Stacey Horner does, knock out the enzymes yeah. and then see what happens. So what are you trying to do right now? And you're, are you trying to identify some of the enzymes? Yes. So we're trying to... We think we know one of them, uh, but we're working on confirming that if we do knock those out, do we actually see a depletion in the levels of our dimethylcytosine? And so far, we've been fairly successful in that. Um, but So there's an enzyme that would add it, right? Yes. So is, we've been is looking, there something that takes it off as well? We haven't found that yet. <laughs> um, but yes, we found what's called the writer enzyme, we think, um, which is metal 15. So we, we think that this is the enzyme that is placing dimethylcytosine in the M, 
four position on, or the N4 position on the cytosine. So basically, the enzyme's not known in mammals, but we found that it is known in E. coli. So we found what the, and it's, it's RSMH and RSMI are the enzymes that are placing these modifications in E. coli. So we went to go to see if we could find the human orthologs for these, and we were successful. Um, that metal 15 is the uh, ortholog for the one that places it in the N4 position. So these are ancient mechanisms. Oh, yeah. Go, yep. They're in everything, basically. Oh, yeah. So that's what we're working on is just confirming. So what is, remind us what metal stands for. Uh, methyl transferase-like, M-E-T-T-L. Okay. So that's just for the methyl modifications and many other kinds. Exactly. That, but you're, So you're focusing on this particular methyl that's modification. Right. You want to find the writer and maybe the... What do you call the D writer, the eraser? The eraser, the eraser. yes. <laughs> and then there's the reader. That's like the effective, the effector protein yeah. that causes downstream effects. That's a whole nother. That's a whole thing, nother ball right? of wax. Yeah, uh, we haven't gotten to that one yet. And so, if you find the writer and the eraser, you could knock them out and see the effect on what virus re reproduction? Exactly. Any sort of mechanism that we think that this uh, modification is having a role in in the cell. Um, so if it's, you know, an antiviral thing or if it's something that is viral uh, trying to suppress or subvert the immune response of the cell. It's probably all of the above, right? We're hoping. Some yeah. of it is antiviral, <laughs> I'm sure. The cell doing something to mm -hmm. And then the virus is countering in some way to oh, yeah. get around. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. Yeah. So. And uh, so how far do you think you will get? You're in your fifth year. Mm -hmm. How far are you going to get in this problem? It can go on and on. You can't stay here forever. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, not. Yeah. yeah. Good one. <laughs> Cargo bags to differ. Right. <laughs> so how far do I think I'm going to get in this problem? That's a good question. Um, I think that we would like to find the mechanism, the confirm that we know that this is the writer enzyme. I would love okay. to be able to find an eraser and a writer. Um, but it kind of all depends on what shakes out in this first initial phase of, of researching it. Um, right now, I'm working on cataloging like what kind of modifications occur yeah, in different sure. cell lines and actually in mosquitoes. So this is what we've been working on collaborating with Alex over here. Um, so right oh, now... You're looking at this particular modification in mosquitoes infected with viruses. Yes, that's what we're okay. working on. Well, we're looking at all of the modifications because we have that capability. Yeah, but, yeah. You're putting um, yes, mosquitoes in the mass spec. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we digest them down first, but yes, effectively. Mosquito take, RNA. Yeah. Yep. The whole but total RNA in the mosquitoes. Minus the legs, system. though, right? Minus legs. Now, why do, you, why do you don't want the legs? There's nothing in them? <laughs> no, we do. <laughs> <laughs> that we, when we were discussing before, yeah, we were saying we do want the legs because we want to know if the virus is disseminated. Um, you know, so when we do transmission assays, we take the whole mosquito, we grind it up just to see if there's infection at all, and that's, you know, in the gut. Then we pull the legs, which contain hemolymph, the circulatory fluid, and if there's virus there, we know it disseminated out of the gut. And then we do transmission assays to see if it is uh, actually in the saliva. So ideally, if we had all those steps, we could look for different modifications that are, um, you know, uh, targets for uh, or, or, you know, different Focus. markers, mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. for these different steps and vector components. Okay. So, so Rachel, what viruses are you looking at? Uh, Zika virus primarily. Only, only yeah, Zika. I'm, I'm pretty committed to Zika virus, though I have done infections with all the other ones that we've mentioned in the past for mm -hmm. that, that other paper. But right now, that's my main focus. You know, you could find something amazing and not want to leave. That could happen. Then you have to decide whether it's better to stay or... <laughs> well, it's kind uh, of like... Um, this is a bad analogy, but <laughs> the World Trade Center fell and Giuliani said, I have to stay on and, and Bloomberg had been elected. He says, I'm the only one who can fix this. And Bloomberg said, no, it's time for you to go. And it actually turned out all right for Bloomberg to take over. Right. But you could find an amazing thing, right? I could. And then you have to hand it off and go somewhere else. It's well, a tough decision. We'll, we'll it's see a really what happens. Tough decision. See what happens. But what are you? Be okay with we'll cross that bridge when I get to it. So you were on this paper, which uh, showed the mass spec approach to to identify all these, compare the different viruses. Have you, have you got other papers published yet, or in the in the works? In the works. Yeah. So, like I mentioned, we're cataloging a lot of the modifications that occur in all these different cell lines. Um, with Zika virus, but for right now, we're still trying to find other interesting patterns that are worth pursuing. So, like that dimethylcytosine was really convenient for us because it had such a robust trend that was, you know, um, consistent. So now we're looking in, maybe there's a similar modification that occurs in mosquitoes, and maybe it helps the transmission from one host to the other, that kind of stuff.
Yeah, the, the functional relevance is what's yeah. cool, right? Not just cataloging, but saying, what is this doing now? Right. And you're going to leave just when you get to that. Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. No, no. But you could always Fortunate do Fortunate for the next day. Yeah, right. Yeah. See? Um, so why, you mentioned that it's really hot. Why did it get hot now and not 20 years ago? What's the difference? Well, there's more tools available now, um, which makes it a little bit easier. So RNA seq, yep, that's that's definitely part of it. Um, as RNA sequencing technologies have gotten better, we've been able to isolate um, modified RNAs and look specifically at where the modifications are. Whereas we didn't have that capability 20 years ago. Um, so that, I think that's a big part of it. I think you mentioned this earlier, but for for uh, G DNA, you can do genome-wide mapping of modification on a base-to-base -base level, right, with different techniques, which have names I can't remember, but can you do the same thing with, yes. with the, R the total RNA? Yes. yes. So there's, um, there's a lot of different techniques, and I'm by no means an expert because I focus on my mass spec <laughs> technique a lot, but there are sequencing techniques that do have single nucleotide resolution where you can find where certain modifications are. Um, but you can't do that with all of the modifications, which is why we're doing this other approach where we can look at all the modifications but don't know the location. Right. So. Yeah, I think this is uh, fascinating and looking forward to the next years where we understand what these are doing, mm -hmm. right? It's going to be great. Um, and what's your plan? You're going to do a postdoc next? Or I think you mentioned yeah, something. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in going into pharmaceuticals. So right. I'm, I'm doing an internship in industry, and I'm going to see how I like that and then, you know, maybe decide from there. So you might go right into a, a company. Potentially, yes. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, you can do modification, right? You can convince them that exactly. this is important. Tell them how important it is, exactly. Right. They don't know everything, you know. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck. That's great. That's Thank good you. stuff. So, Alex, your lab, this, the arbovirus lab at the Wadsworth, you said we, you do clinical surveillance and research, right? Yes. So people send clinical samples? So you have an actual so clinical the, laboratory. The there. clinical lab is um, limited to plaque reduction neutralization tests. So Best, best assay in the world, yep. plaque assay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So if somebody um, sends a serological or a sample that tests for positive uh, by serology to the diagnostic immunology lab at Wadsworth, we get that sample for confirmatory PRNT. Okay. The reason we do that clinical assay is obviously it's an infectious assay because we're you know, combining um, the, the serum with the virus, so that's why it's done. That, so that's the only clinical assay we do. It used to be a really small part of what we did um, until Zika hit, and then we went from maybe doing um, you know, a hundred PRNTs a year. Um, and then two years ago, I think we did like 2000 or something. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're just doing arboviruses, right? It's limited to arboviruses. Yeah. And yeah, so, so it's still, you know, a relatively small part of, of what we do, but it is, um, you know, a bit more than, than what we used to do. So the increase is because of travel related Zika infections? Yes. People coming back from areas in, where it's endemic and yeah. wondering if they're infected. Or, okay. Exactly. Yeah. So there was, um, you know, obviously a big push when with the epidemic, um, mostly um, pregnant women or women of childbearing age that wanted to be tested. And it, it's complicated because it's been very difficult to serologically distinguish between Zika and dengue. Mm -hmm. um, so we ultimately, we did try to do that initially um, and in some cases you can get separation but we ultimately moved to a screening assay because we usually weren't able to to make that call anyway so it's a lot of just kind of flavivirus positives um, and you know the the complications exacerbated by the fact that most people that spend a lot of time in south or central america have at some point been exposed Both. to dengue so yes, yes. you know they're going to have a some Mm -hmm. positivity. There. Okay, yeah. yeah. That's a tough one, because if you took their serum, you would neutralize both dengue and Zika, and you don't know. Right, and you have the four serotypes of dengue, so mm -hmm. how much do you want to include all four in the assay, and um, there's a lot of cross-reactivity there. So Okay, and then you have a, you have a surveillance. We do. So what does that involve? So there are, I think, 13 um, individual counties that participate right now. So anyone who wants to participate will will test their mosquitoes. Um, so during transmission season, county health departments as well as some state uh, workers go out and 
trap mosquitoes um, with a combination of CDC light traps or gravid traps, and they have these new BG traps for Aedes albopictus. Um, and they send us, they, they speciate them, send us pools of 40 to 50 mosquitoes. Um, we might get, you know, in the, in the middle of the summer, hundreds of pools a day, and we test all those. Um, so we're the primary tester for West Nile um, and Eastern Equine Encephalitis virus, um, which we focus on because we have a foci in central New York um, where the, uh, the primary vector, uh, Chelicida melanora, um, is in the, the swamps up there, and there have been periodic cases. And um, then we test all the 80s albopictus for, for Zika as well. We've never had a local uh, Zika positive, but we continue to do that, and I think we will at least one more year. Um, and then all the non-Culex, Culex being the primary West Nile vector, go on to cell culture. Um, and actually, we, I should say we put everything on cell culture to kind of compare this year. And any, anything that grows up, anytime we see CP, we then move that to um, a multiplex real-time assay for some of the, the um, less prevalent arboviruses. So we have a panel of eight that we test for. Mm -hmm. um, so West Nile and Western equine encephalitis are the two main ones? Eastern equine. E Eastern, of course. Yeah. What, what other... Viruses, do you um, so we see um, Cash Valley virus pretty frequently. Cash Valley? Yep. What's that? Bunya virus. A Bunya virus. Yeah, wow. or, well, so, you know, that taxonomy is <laughs> all changed recently, so I don't know what it currently is. Um, so lacrosse, um, mm -hmm. we haven't seen in many years, but we test for it, and it has been in New York historically. Um, we see Jamestown Canyon virus. So, um, yeah, there's some... Did you have Poisson here at some point? We have po we have Poisson still. Yep. Still, okay. So, and in fact, it's been increasing in prevalence. So that's um, obviously tick-borne. Um, so Poisson or deer tick, you know, they're mm -hmm. two lineages of the same virus. Um, and what we see primarily is deer tick virus, which is the lineage to um, Poisson. And that's, um, we've seen a general trend of increasing prevalence that's matched the increased prevalence that we've seen with these other tick-borne viruses. Um, and we're doing a lot more tick surveillance than we, we did historically, um, primarily for that, that reason, um, more ticks in the area. Um, there's a separate group that does the tick surveillance um, for the other agents, the non-viral agents, and then we get their leftover ticks and we <laughs> test them for Poisson. Um, and you know we, we've been doing some testing for heartland virus recently, which um, is vectored by the Lone Star Tick, which has been uh, it was pretty prevalent down down by you guys actually, and particularly in Long Island. Um, and uh, yeah, so we look for some other um, other viruses also. But. So, so the culicine are the main mosquitoes for West Nile, right? Yeah, Culix pipians, the northern house mosquito. Yep, then, um, here yep. around here, and then you also have albopictus circulating here, right? We don't have Aedes albopictus here. We the farthest north they're probably um, um, consistently found, and they've been looking a lot more since Zika is maybe Rockland, North North Rockland. I mean, occasionally they'll trap a uh, albopictus in another location. They've even found them in western New York. But as far as established populations, they've been gradually moving north, but um, it looks like Rockland, northern Rockland is okay. probably the, the boundary at this point. I went to a talk of, by, a New York, by the New York City entomologist, the chief guy, I don't know, okay. but he said they have, of course, no, no 80s aegypti, but they have colonies of albopictus yep. throughout the five boroughs that they monitor yep. consistently. Yep. I can see what's going on there. So when you look at all these mosquitoes, what like what fraction are positive for viruses and does that change when you see people having reporting with disease? I guess West Nile would be the main one that you would yeah, see. Yeah, so right? West Nile um, actually this past year was the second highest on record for New York State. Uh, how many cases? Um, 90 cases. Okay. Um, and but, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's only 90 cases. Why do we pay attention to it? But remember, the majority are subclinical, right? So generally what gets diagnosed are, are you know, the, the cases that are neurologic. Um, so, so we miss most of them. But 
Um, the mosquito populations, the, the, the prevalence um, during kind of a peak is, is around uh, 5%, something like mm -hmm. that. Um, Not a lot, right? Yeah. It can get a little, so it's, um, you know, you can get regions that, um, or locations that go much higher for short periods of time. Um, you know, once we see a positive somewhere, we usually keep seeing positives and we might have high prevalence. And, and there's a lot of variation. There's different counties have different um, trapping schemes. And, um, you know, for instance, Suffolk County is really well surveyed and you can get a lot of variation from traps that are just a few miles apart. So um, I've been kind of spending a lot of time looking at how much of that prevalence, um, while we know there's environmental factors that contribute to that, is um, can, is driven to some extent by you know variability in, in the virus. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of what I'm doing is doing some uh, a, a lot of sequencing of West Nile. It's and, and a lot of analysis and, and some phylogeography and, and looking for um, patterns between you know the the epi side and the and the mm -hmm. viral evolution side. So there are micro e ecosystems that have concentrations of virus maybe related to what animal hosts birds that may be reservoirs yeah it could be birds it could be um you know breeding sites um mm. so, so um, they breed in water so they breed they lay their eggs in water yeah their rafts are in water um the culex so the culex the, mosquitoes, the right? culex lay egg rafts okay. um and you know the, and that requires constant water so they do you know hatch and develop in that water 80s um, will lay on the edge of water and they can survive long periods of time without water and actually you can store those eggs and which make make them a little easier to work with in the lab um, but yeah so standing water uh, um, you know humidity temperature all these all these variables um, and certainly bird populations mm -hmm. um, and um, so if a Will they breed in a bottle cap? Is that enough water for them to lay eggs in? Or is it, do they need a stream with lots of flowing water? Well, so, I mean, it depends on the species and the population. But, yeah, they will. I mean, we, we do it in the lab. So we um, have, you know, various experiments where we're looking at, um, we've looked at vertical transmission in mosquitoes, for instance, or we've just wanted to measure fecundity of the mosquito. And we'll, we can put a, a pretty small container, um, a, you know, a medicine cup, um, in the the cup where we're holding them, mm -hmm. they'll they'll lay eggs in there. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, is there a relationship between the sequences and where you find them? Uh, it, there must be different quasi species yeah. in different locales, right? Yeah, they're quite diverse. So, if you look at West Nile um, on a global or national level, it looks like it's been relatively static. Um, but I mean, a couple things, even on. The state level, I and mean, this is stuff that we're just trying to get published right now. We've updated all the um, phylogeny of West Nile in New York State recently, and we've seen some emergent genotypes where we have consensus changes that are um, taking over, and the, those are coincident with this actual increased activity that we've seen since 2010. So we, we think that there's something there potentially, and we're looking into that. Um, but if you zoom in to... Um, you know, smaller spatial scales, it, there's a surprising amount of diversity, even um, among, you know, trap sites, again, that are five or 10 miles apart. Yeah. You can see they're, they're dominated by different um, genotypes at different times. And then, as you know, if you dive deeper, which we, you know, the, one of the main focuses of my work historically has been to look at the importance of the mutant swarm, um, and you start to look at those minority variants, then it gets, um, even more daunting, but there's a lot more diversity there. And um, we've seen some interesting things where that minority genotype signatures it can, uh, to some extent, be associated with uh, the location that you you trap that mosquito in. And, and um, we've had some some real interesting new new data come out of this all this updated sequencing we're doing with West Nile. So, so do you see similar patterns in isolates from people? Um, there's been less work on that, but yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we don't have a lot of those. The work that's been done, um, it's, it's hard to get an isolate, first of all, because usually by the time somebody gets 
to the doctor, you know, you're past the viremic phase. Um, but certainly blood donors and, and um, there have been some, you know, phylogeny human isolates done, not by us, but others through the years. And there is, yeah, there's some diversity there. Um, I haven't seen any detailed um, deep sequencing of human isolates, and it's, I'm not totally clear on, you know, the, the level of quasi-species structure within a human, but I assume that it's quite diverse. Too. It must be different in, on a state-to-state -state level also, right? Yeah, although there is a lot of mixing, right? So it's, it's complex, I and mean, you have birds flying, right? So, yeah, um, yeah. you know, it's, I think the primary selective pressures are the mosquito populations, but then you have mixing happening all the time. Um, we had the big outbreak in 2012 in Texas, and um, our strains in 2013 were more related to those 2012 Texas isolates than they were to the 2011 New York isolates. So, um, so you see that a lot, and that's why on a broad scale, oftentimes that structure that might be important is, is mm -hmm. lost. So um, the main reservoir for, for West Nile is birds. It's birds yeah. do, do they also have mammalian rodent hosts um, at all or no? There's been a lot of studies looking at the potential for different mammals to, I mean, they all become viremic. West Nile infects everything. Um, but in general, it's believed that the viremia is not high enough to perpetuate the cycle. So you can't get um, an infected mosquito to feed on a, an infected mammal and, and become, mm. or a, a naive mosquito to become infected feeding on. And same with animal. humans, right? We would not transmit it Correct. that way either, right? Yeah. The viremia is not high enough. Right. So, but in birds it is. It is, yeah. Right? And so what, what do you think causes uh, higher numbers in, in certain years of, of human cases? What's that related to? I think it's a combination of things that certainly there, the climate is, is playing a, a big role. Yeah. Warm years tend to be higher for multiple reasons. I mean, we've done a lot of studies looking at the relationship of temperature to transmission. And um, I mean, in general, th this is, you know, varies from from population to population and place to place but general higher temperatures means more mosquitoes developing faster um, it means you know more viral replication more viral transmission um, also when there's drought we know that you know birds will congregate and you can get um, situations that are, are more conducive to to transmission um, so What's primarily driving it is probably the mosquito population levels at any year, but I, I do think there's a role for, for viral genotype that's been maybe somewhat overlooked. I mean, we had the story way back when, when the West Nile O2 genotype took over, and that is more competent, um, particularly in Culex tarsalis, which are the primary vector in the Midwest. So by competent, you mean it replicates better in the vector, Replicates right? better and is transmitted more efficiently. Um, so that displacement event happened and likely contributed, but since then there haven't been a lot of um, studies that have seen or um, identified important mutations that drive transmission. I mean, West Nile didn't have to adapt, you know, to do well here. We already had competent vectors and, and hosts, um, but I think, you know, we are recently seeing some more some more adaptation. So mm. It's weird that it gets warm, there's less water, yet there's more activity. Right kind of counterintuitive right? right but the idea that birds congregate is interesting yeah yeah that's so Dixon de Pommier who is one of my co-hosts on Twiv he wrote he wrote this little book called West Nile story kind of detailing the first oh cool little yeah, thing and he says when in under drought the birds go away so the mosquitoes bite people I, mean, I don't know if that's well, part of the situation yeah also. so I mean that is also a really important um, part of this. So we used to think that there was a bridge vector, that Culex pipians were the primary vector, and then uh -huh. at okay. some point there was a bridge vector, um, you know, an 80 species, species likely that um, then caused the human infections. But um, the more that folks looked into that, the more we realized it is Culex pipians that dri it's drives it. Um, and studies done by um, Marm Kilpatrick, actually, with, with Laura Kramer, um, many years back now, showed that when you, later in, in the season, the, the preferential host for Culex pipians oftentimes are, are American robins. Um, and when they leave, 
um, the, we see this switch, you know, based on blood meal analysis to more feeding on mammals, including humans. And that coincides with kind of the peak of Gilux pipians levels. And then, you know, in the, in the late summer, and that's when we see the highest number of human cases. Um, so that story is maybe not totally complete, but we, we know that those, yeah. um, those shifts in feeding preference are happening um, that probably drive uh, human disease. So with uh, global warming trends, yeah. what's going to be the effect on West Nile, say? Um, I mean, the overall effect is, is probably going to increase activity. Um, you know, we've done some studies where particular populations, we do see a detrimental fitness effect from higher temperatures. Um, so that could counter that to some extent. But those studies also haven't taken into account the possibility that the mosquito itself can adapt. Sure. This is happening gradually. So, you know, <laughs> sure. the way we do these studies is we throw them at two degrees higher. Yeah, yeah. And right. we say what happens. <laughs> but, you know, if you have this gradual increase, it, it's hard to say. But, yeah, in general, you see increased temperature increases transmission. Sometimes we see an opposite effect. So it, it, what makes all this very daunting list because we do all this population-specific competent stuff with not just West Nile, but dengue and Zika and um, chikungunya. And, um, you know, once in a while you'll see a population that doesn't behave like the others where you increase the temperature and the competence goes down. So the story is much more complex in terms of, you know, um, genotype by genotype by temperature interactions yeah, sure. that determine competence. So. So you mentioned that Abu Pictus is as far north as uh, Rockland County. Yeah. So would that range increase with It warming? is predicted to, yeah. yeah. So certainly the threat from 80s vectored viruses is mm -hmm. um, potentially going to increase. Has 80s aegypti ever been in New York State? Um, New Jersey. Uh -huh. There's been reports of it in New Jersey, but not that I'm aware of in, in New York State. Recently? Recently, yeah. I think... But at some point, it historically, didn't, uh, it yeah. reached Philadelphia. Right. At some, there was yeah. yellow fever in Philadelphia, yeah. right? Yeah, yellow fever, right, prior to the big eradication programs, yeah. But maybe as temperature increases, that range would also increase, right, depending on how it, warm it got. It's certainly predicted, too. So, yeah, albopictus are a little more tolerant of more moderate temperatures. But, yeah, the aegypti can, can do well and mm -hmm. are predicted to keep moving north and west. I mean, they're a big problem in California now. Um, mm -hmm. Which has, you know, been recent. So yeah, it's it's changing. Yeah, and that, there would come Zika, right? As far north as Albany. Yeah, you know, the potential is always there. Um, whether or not we could have persistent, um, we're not likely to have li big epidemics because you know we don't we go inside where there's air conditioning. Exactly. We have screens and we have air conditioning, <laughs> right? right. Um, so I tell people in southern countries, people sit on the porch to get heat relief and they get, get bitten, right? Yeah, right? So speaking of bitten, the culicines are night biters? Is that um, right? Dawn and dusk, yeah. Dusk. Yeah. In the 80s, when do they? Um, they'll, they'll bite all well, day. They're all day. pretty, <laughs> yeah, pretty aggressive, um, particularly aegypti, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so... The culicine is only an issue if you're out at night, dusk. Generally. Dusk. I mean, that's not always the case, but yeah. generally. Yeah. Interesting. So you also have done a number of papers where you try and change the hosts of yeah. viruses and see what happens. And there's one interesting adaptation of Ravensburg virus. Yes. To, what, what is, I've never heard of Ravensburg. So this was <laughs> originally, and I guess to some extent, is still considered another lineage of West Nile, okay. isolated in the Czech Republic. Um, so, but it's, it's about... 20% divergent from West Nile genetically. Um, maybe that's not exactly of the paper in front of you, but around <laughs> there. So it's quite different. And we, we, we were able to get it in the lab. Yeah, that's about right. 76% shared. Okay. Um, <laughs> there you go. And it's interesting because it seems to not uh, replicate at physiological temperatures in vertebrates. So, um, you know, my, including birds, right? Including birds, right. yeah, yeah. So we put it in birds and, and got um, novaremia. Um, and in cell culture, if we drop the temperature of the cells, we can get it to replicate. Um, not still not as efficient as um, West Nile. Um, 
even at the lower temperatures. But so there's there's clearly both a temperature and a host barrier there, and there's still some uncertainty as to how this virus was ever maintained. We did see that it does a little better at being vertically passed in mosquitoes as compared to to um, you know regular West Nile um, lineage one, and um, it may be maintained that way. But we think there's probably a host. It could be an amphibian. Um, or reptilian host. Ooh. It's not because it does grow. I know. It grows, future project. I don't know if it's published, but it, um, somebody showed that. It, um, I think we we may have done it once in our lab where it grew in, in frog cells, pretty pretty well. So, yeah. I mean, I'm very interested in host range and right. viral adaptation, host adaptation. So, um, any time I can find a virus that's interesting like that, I try to figure out why. So we've we still would like to take that project further because it's still not clear. Um, um, particularly what the what the restriction is mechanistically and then the genetic determinants because there's so many differences. We did passage studies um, trying to adapt to vertebrate cells and gradually increasing the temperature. We got some adaptation um, and a couple shared mutations, but um, we could never get it to get anywhere near you know wild type mm-hmm. replication or West Nile replication. So. Um, We'd like we'd we'd like to make a Ravensburg clone and start swapping some genes and nice. um, get a host range determined. So you can, it it won't infect at thirty seven or very poorly. Right. Mosquito cells. I mean, it means mosquito cells in culture. What temperature do you typically grow them? Twenty eight. Twenty eight. It will grow in those. It will, uh, and it will uh, replicate to low levels if you transfect at thirty seven. You can get virus out. So it has something to do with infection entry. Um, but it's still low levels, so there's multiple things going on there. So what's the natural cycle, and what did you say? It was from Czechoslovakia originally? Yeah, so we don't know, because so there was never a, a vertebrate isolate. There, there were maybe three mosquito isolates from Culex, and um, beyond that, we don't know. It never caused any human disease that we're aware of. Um, so it's either vertically passed and maintained within mosquitoes, or there's you know, an alternate host that we haven't identified yet. And only been found in that geographic yeah. area, nowhere else. Right. But you think maybe uh, amphibians could be a host, right? Yeah. Do we know, do mosquitoes bite frogs? I guess. Some, so. yeah, certainly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they pop their head out of the water, they get bitten. I always right. have this view of how does a mosquito bite a bird, right? But right. they right. sleep, so I guess that's yeah. what happens, right? Because yeah. when they're flying around, there's no way they're going <laughs> to catch them. <laughs> um, so this uh, Ravensburg, uh, oh, you mentioned, so it could exist only in mosquitoes and be passed vertically. That's because you're not going to go, mos- mosquitoes don't bite each other, obviously. Right. And it's right. not. They don't have sex, right? They lay eggs and the eggs no, are fertilized. They, they do have sex? They, they do, yeah. So you can have venereal transmission too. Really? Lacrosse virus is, is pretty good at that. Actually, lacrosse is unique in that it's uh, highly efficient vertically and, and venereally. And they, okay, but that virus goes to accidental other hosts, right? Yeah. But theoretically, a virus could exist only in mosquitoes by venereal and vertical transmission. Right, and you do have a lot of mosquito-only viruses um, you know, the more we look, the more we find. So that, that can happen. It's highly inefficient for most arboviruses, um, although we also published on Zika, because um, Zika seems to be good at everything. Um, <laughs> Zika, relative to other arboviruses, in particular other flaviviruses, dengue and West Nile, is, is uh, pretty good at vertical transmission also in the mosquito. Mm-hmm. Um, not, not enough likely to, to um, maintain the virus, but you know, potentially enough to mm-hmm. supplement transmission during breaks and in, in horizontal transmission. So of course, most mosquitoes need, the, f- the females need to take blood meals, right? right. So at some point, it, these viruses could be introduced into a host. Right. So it could replicate well, there. Right, so that's the thing, you can have this maintenance um, vertically and then the occasional spillover back. Um, yeah, I mean, it, you lose it along the way, so you can have you need it needs to be vertically passed and then transstatally passed, you know, through the larvae, pupae, and adult, and then be transmitted. So a lot of mm-hmm. it's a big ask for the virus, but we know there's a recent paper that came out showing that vertical tr- or um, you can get transmission of Zika following vertical transmission in the mosquito. So mm-hmm. it, it can happen. Um, yeah, Zika. 
Zika seems to be good at everything. So in places where, the, where there are winters, yes, the mosquitoes hibernate, right? So Culex do. Culex pipians, the primary vector of West Nile, go into diapause, like a hibernation state, and they go into hibernacula in the winter um, in that state. Now, 80s overwinter as eggs, so the, the eggs will survive the winter. Um, but the Culex do do that, and we believe that West Nile is probably maintained in the, these hibernacular because if you when you do the sequencing you see you know although we have these exceptions where strains are coming in in general the evidence shows uh, local maintenance so yeah that's what i wanted to ask how what state is the virus in right yeah. that it could yeah. sit there and the rna is not degraded for long periods yeah Interesting. So where do the, the Culex go uh, in the winter just under the leaves or no like the, the Culex go to caves basically, or, you know, cave-like Mosquito places. cave. Yeah, so... Um, Mosquito cafe. <laughs> we, we actually used to have, we used to have a bigger field component in our lab, and we had a group that would, we did this overwintering study where um, these, uh, these two individuals would go out and they would uh, mark, find these caves, mm -hmm. and they were marking, counting the mosquitoes in the cave wall, uh, watching out for bats and rats and whatnot. And um, they went in weekly or every couple of weeks and just monitored the population. Um, and also marked some of them, how did we do this? Oh no, in a different study, we marked them with fluorescent um, dye and, and tried to catch them when they emerged in the spring, which that was you know, pretty interesting too. But what we saw, and this is another thing related to temperature, is that you know, when it, diapause is broken by increased temperature primarily. So if you have warm temperatures in the middle of the winter that are occur for a long enough duration to make mosquitoes leave these hibernacula, then the overwinter, the winter population will decrease. And you actually, that effect could be um, a later season because mm -hmm. less mosquitoes in the spring. And um, so the relationship between climate and mosquito populations is complex. Mm. Neat. Now, one, all right, one more question. Um, there are some mosquitoes that just have sap and they don't take blood meals, I understand, right? Is that correct? So, no, all the females need to take blood meals to produce their eggs. I mean, some maintain themselves on blood, like Aedes aegypti, more frequently and don't just take sugar, but... Yeah, there's none that just take sugar because I read there was an maybe, article. No, no, maybe there are some species that do that. Where they took yeah. some of those and you they, probably know they better than me. them to blood meals, and there was a fitness oh, clause yeah, okay, associated right. with that. Because yeah. when you take hot blood, yeah. the mosquito it shocks them, and probably it's full of stress stresses problems. them. Yeah, <laughs> probably stresses them. it is a, a super. It's a very stressful, <laughs> metabolically challenging yeah. process. I mean, you think about it, and the the changes that occur with blood meal intake and digestion in a mosquito are, are significant. Right. We, we look at the microbiome often that, uh, and the immune response of the mosquitoes and, um, and uh, it's, the, you know, the, the mosquito completely transforms with a blood meal. And often that is when we see death. You know, for mosquitoes that are weak, they'll take a blood meal and they won't survive digesting that blood meal. So yeah, you're mm -hmm. right, it is a so, significant. Another question, do you see um, Varemia bats then? Um, it's a because good I, uh, question. Bats have got a higher body temperature, don't they? I think it's 39. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know if we, there's been isolates in nature with bats. I'm oh. assuming that they can get infected. Yeah. Um, certainly, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. So you, these bats in the caves will eat the infected mosquitoes. That's what you're thinking about? Right, yeah. 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 Or get bitten. Or get bitten. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, although they stop blood feeding when they go okay. into diapause. Ah, okay. okay. So that's, that's been part of the mystery because if they don't blood feed when they're going into diapause, how are, how's the virus ever getting into the mosquito? And the thought is that actually may occur by vertical transmission, those rare vertically transmitted um, mosquitoes will then go into diapause and um, yeah, so it's it's pretty interesting. So uh, the sap only mosquitoes. The reason I ask you that is, do they have viruses? And if so, they must be totally vertically or venereally right. transmitted, right? Yeah, because they don't bite mammalian hosts. Right, right. Mm. That's interesting. 
Well, we don't, you don't know anything about I don't know viruses. Anything about those. That, no. <laughs> it would be interesting for people to sample and see if there are viruses in them. Right? Yeah. And I'm sure there are. You know, when we, uh, yeah, everything has a virus. Right? Shotgun sequencing now. And, you know, I'm really interested in co infections now. And, you know, the more you look, the more you realize how complex, you know, we look at the microbiome a lot now, but we're also, um, we've done some studies where we're just doing, you know, shotgun sequencing to look for other viruses and mm -hmm. found 10 different. In one mosquito? Yeah. That's yeah, mosquito surprising, only. Right? Mostly, you know, these mosquito only viruses. You know, there's a, and and so a lot of that variation in vector competence from place to place or population to population, you know, may have something to do with these, you know, co infections, the whole biome, you know. Yeah, sure. So, no, I, I think, I mean, we're multiply infected all yeah, the time. Right. Does the microbiome of a mosquito have an effect on what viruses it carries? Um, it's in the gut, right? Yeah, I mean, we certainly know it influences the uh, replication and vector competence. Um, so it, and you know, you know the story of Wolbachia, and that's the one yeah. intracellular obligate um, that we know directly interferes. But um, we found a lot of potentially new, um, new taxa with Zika um, studies that seem to be uh, correlated with increased or decreased replication of Zika. I don't, you know, whether it's a direct relationship or it's something else, we don't, we don't know that yet, but um, there's a, a huge effect on, on the microbial community with infection. And then in terms of susceptibility, um, you know, there's definitely differences with microbial community. What's hard is you, you want to track an individual and you can't do that, you know, because I want to look before and after. Right. So, um, I mean, it's really interesting because you wonder, because the gut is the primary restriction site, right? Is once they can get out of the gut, then they can be transmitted. And right. so you sort of do wonder about what the microbiome is doing in the gut to facilitate that, that will preventing or promoting that, bar that barrier. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot going on. And there's a lot, yeah, I mean, used to, a lot of people say, oh, RNAi is the whole story with invertebrate immunity, but we know that these other, you know, innate pathways that are more associated with bacterial infections play a role too, and those are all obviously affected by mm -hmm. that population. We did a couple of papers on TWIB, one where a fungus in the mosquito gut influenced virus replication. In fact, I think it was, it was facilitating it. I don't remember which way it went. I think Fungus was secreting inhibitors of proteases that yeah. were going to digest the virus right. otherwise. And then there was a more recent one. I don't remember if it was a bacteria or a fungus. But again, people are doing that and looking at relationships between micro... Because it's, it, it's there, right? You can't ignore it. Yeah. Um, they're going to have an influence. I mean, I have a... My unrealistic vision is that at <laughs> some point we'll incorporate a lot more information into surveillance. Right. So right now we test and we say positive or negative. There's nothing preemptive in terms of testing for risk. And there's nothing beyond positive or negative that tells us, you know, predictively what's, what's going to happen next. So if we can at some point get genetic, you know, viral genetic signatures and microbial signatures, out of mosquito RNA pools, RNA <laughs> modification <laughs> signatures, which is another reason to do this. And then you have this big mess of information that you can say, um, you know, you should spray here. I mean, that's yeah, the goal. Just, just pour it into a computer, it will tell you. Right. With the right program. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's a whole other department, spraying, right? Yeah, and we, we don't do that, but we just, you know, and in fact, we don't even make recommendations. We just report positives. And, and then they decide what to do? Yeah. What do they spray with? Do you know? Um, I think um, they're using, is it malathion um, primarily? It's been what they've been using for a while. And there's, there's some um, larvicides, too, um, that they do, you know, some dumps in, like, places where you have a lot of standing water. Like BT is one of them, right? They put yeah. They BT tablets yeah. in. Yeah. Yep. And um, can you see a day when you'll release modified mosquitoes that inter like Wolbachia modified that interrupt transmission? Is that a reality or just? Well, yeah. I mean, well, it's been done as you know in some places. Um, and the sterile um, male thing is a, is 
that's the big kick right now. And that's, I mean, I think it's a little easier for the public to digest, although you're still saying we're going to release thousands of new mosquitoes into your right. community. <laughs> so that is, it can be a tough sell regardless, but if they're not genetically modified, well, they are genetically modified, but if you just say they're sterile and we, st we sterilize them by irradiating them, then that's a little more appealing. And that does work in locations. The, the problem is you got to get everybody on board um, at every level. And um, so, yeah, I think it just depends. Um, they're, they're definitely realistic tools. Well, Baki is one, but only for Aedes aegypti, really, because they're the only ones that don't naturally have it. So culicines have Wolbachia? Every, yeah, everything else has Wolbachia. We're doing some other work looking at levels of native Wolbachia in the gut, so we think that may be important in determining culic, or, um, vector competence for Culex pipiens and Aedes albopictus, because everyone's always just ground up the whole mosquito and looked at Wolbachia, but most Wolbachia is in the germline. So if you do that, you know, miss some of that variability that's in the gut where it matters, where it's interacting with the virus. So I think there may be some room to mess with the native Wolbachia levels um, with some other species. But, you know, for now, it's just happening with Aedes aegypti. Yeah, the, the trial they did in Australia, yeah. which is remarkable, it had a huge effect on dengue incidents. Yeah. Over four years, I think. They, it was a small community, so they could do a lot of communication. Right. And that's an important part of it. You have right. to tell people, because, you know, people don't want... GMO food, so they don't want GMO mosquitoes. Right. <laughs> right. But they even involved kids in the mosquito release. They bring out buckets to, and that's the way to do it. But in a yeah. big place, it's hard to get people. Right. There's too many people to inform them all. Right. All right. That's a great uh, episode. I really enjoyed that. It's time. I think it's time for us to wrap up, right? Yep. And, and um, next appointment. <laughs> at 11.30, 11.30, right? 11.30. Okay. That gives me enough time to break down. So that is TWIV. I don't know what the number will be, but it's a special episode because we're <laughs> yeah. in Albany. Now you can listen to TWIV on any podcast player, like on your phone or tablet. If you do, we'd like you to subscribe so that you get every episode. It doesn't cost you a penny. It doesn't make your phone any heavier to have all the podcasts on it. <laughs> and that way we know how many people are listening. That can help us to support the show. If you really like what we do, please consider supporting us financially. You can give as little as a dollar a month over at microbe.tv slash contribute. We would really appreciate that. It would help us to expand uh, the reach of our show. And of course, if you have questions and comments, always send them to twiv at microbe.tv. My guest today here in Albany, New York, Kara Pogger, my host. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. for you, you, You've uh, invited me, and I'm here as your guest. And um, it's really great to see that you have done really well since the last TWIV. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. And you've, you're funded. You've got a wonderful lab with wonderful people who I had breakfast with this morning. So keep it up. Thank it's you. really great. And uh, Rachel Netsband, thank, thank you for joining us. Good luck. Thank you. Enjoy your... Um, your, your stint at Regeneron. Oh, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> I'm sure I will. Good luck with the um, epi, epitranscriptomics. Yes. <laughs> and from the Wadsworth Center, Alex Sioda, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I see why you've been doing this for 15 years. It's fascinating. It is very fun. Do you go out and, co and do field work too? Uh, no, generally not. Because I think we're that, really desperate. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to, but it could be fun when it's nice out, right? Yeah, absolutely. Go outside, and uh, going outside is good to get it out of the confines of, of a room. For sure. So uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank all you. of you. It's been a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank ASV and ASM. They both give support to TWIV. And Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in virology thanks for joining us we'll be back next week another twiv is viral <laughs>